Good evening, everyone. It's wonderful to have such a packed house uh, for tonight's lecture. I'm Emily Ziemba. I'm Director of Curatorial Administration and Research Curator in the Department of Prints and Drawings, and delighted to welcome you to this evening's lecture, which is being given in conjunction with the exhibition Picasso, Drawing from Life. As we begin, a brief reminder, please silence your mobile devices. I know, I'm always the one that forgets. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the speaker for this evening's program, Nancy Ierson. Nancy is the Deputy Director for Collections and Exhibitions and Gunn Family Chief Curator at the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia. She oversees what seems like nearly every aspect of the Barnes permanent collection, including the curatorial, conservation, design and publications, registration, and visual resource departments. A specialist in European art of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, Nancy joined the Barnes in August 2018. In the past five and a half years, she has curated many exhibitions. Among them, the first US retrospective of the painter Suzanne Valadon, an exhibition of the foundation's Native American works called Water, Wind, Breath, Mudiliani, Up Close, which showcased four years of institutional conservation research, and most recently, William Edmondson, A Monumental Vision. After completing her PhD at the Courtauld Institute of Art in 2005, she continued her curatorial career at the National Gallery in London, the Victoria and Albert Museum, and the Morgan Library, before serving as the Rothman Family Curator here at the Art Institute from 2012 until 2015. You may remember the exhibition called Temptation, the Demons of James Ensor, which was the first show at the Art Institute to introduce interactive touchscreens into a major exhibition and the first to have digital and print publications. Nancy also worked extensively on the Art Institute's online scholarly catalog of Kayabat, Gauguin, Monet, and Renoir which are all still available free of charge on the Art Institute's website. As curator of international art at the Tate Modern from 2015 to 2018, she co-curated Picasso 1932, Love, Fame, Tragedy. And it's that research that she'll share with us this evening. Now, I could go on and on detailing Nancy's numerous professional accomplishments, and I swear there are many because she never sleeps. But instead, I will highlight Nancy's delightfully generous spirit. Before she officially started at the Art Institute, she helped me research the provenance of a Degas. And after she left, she was still letting me bounce Picasso ideas off of her. And it was during one of those conversations that I thought, wait a minute, Jay and I can use this. <laughs> I can get Nancy to come here and lecture. And because Nancy never says no to her friends, She's here to us today to tell us all about Picasso's Year of Wonders. So without further delay, please join me in welcoming Nancy to the stage. Well, thank you very much, Emily, for that lovely introduction and Thank you for, for having me. It's marvelous to be back in Chicago with so many friends and colleagues. And thank you for giving up your Thursday evening to hear about Picasso. I hope you've had a chance to see the show. Jay and Emily have done a really marvelous job. And the collection here is just phenomenal. You know, if you're from Chicago, remind yourself just how great this place is. You do have just this incredible collection on your doorstep. It, it's, it's spectacular. So the talk I'm going to give you this evening focuses on one year of an artist's life. There aren't many artists who you can do that with. Picasso is one of them. But I just want to pause for a second as I do this because I want to acknowledge my late colleague, Arkin Borhart hume Arkin was the director of exhibitions at Tate Modern when I worked there, and we co-curated the exhibition together. He also worked on the Cezanne exhibition um, briefly that was at the Art Institute recently, and I know he would be thrilled to think that we were talking about his work tonight. So why 1932? 
People have asked me this, and it's a very good question. There are many reasons. The previous year, in October, Picasso had turned 50, and that's a moment. <laughs> I think many of us can, uh, can think about those big birthdays and what they mean. It was also the year he had his first retrospective exhibition. It was a year that he became the first living artist with a catalog resume. And one of his early works made a record price for a living artist at auction. Um, so those are very significant things to happen to anybody. But I think perhaps one of the things I'll emphasize tonight, and I know that Jay has touched on this on her talk, if you've been to that, is that it's a time when he appears incredibly human. I think we have a tendency with artists to think of them as somehow iconic, especially when it's a name as big as Picasso's, but really they often go through the same um, trials and tribulations as the rest of us. And you'll see some of that as I tell you the story of the year this evening. I just wanna give you a little refresher if you're sort of new to Picasso, if you're just sort of revisiting. Um, he was born in 1881, um, spent some time in Barcelona and gets to Paris in 1900. And that's where the sort of the more familiar story of Picasso starts. He lives in a, a kind of makeshift bunch of studio buildings, which was known as the Bateau Lavoir, literally means laundry boat. There were these laundry uh, sort of facilities on the side of the River Seine. And that's where um, these kind of structures were. And, and this building kind of looked like one of them. So that nickname came about and lots of artists went through that studio space. Now, I want to give you that little snapshot and just remind you of this kind of trajectory that Picasso runs. Um, he very quickly becomes uh, a force to be reckoned with. He has his first show in Paris in 1901. Just giving a little advert for the Barnes here. This is a nice picture that you will see if you care to come to Philadelphia. One of the, well, one of the first modern pictures that Barnes buys, incidentally, but I'll leave that for another time. He becomes interested in, uh, you know, in life uh, on the sort of underside of Paris. Uh, he shows poverty. He's in his 20s. You know, these are very moody works. I was quite moody in my 20s. Maybe you were. Um, there's a lot that, uh, you know, you can imagine. If you think about this in, in purely biographical terms, some of these things make more sense. Um, again, just incredible to see a young artist having this uh, this confidence to use such an economic palette. And so this, you know, I've just shown you pictures from five years. You can see how as a young artist, he's shifting and changing and uh, testing himself. And it was one of those early works that sold for a record price when he was 50. But by 1932, Picasso was a long way from the Bateau Lavoir. He was living in a nice apartment, and you can see him here in the Rue La Boétie uh, with one of his own works, looking very dapper. Had his suits made in London in Savile Row. We did actually try and find the tailor when we were doing the show. We didn't succeed, but it's a thing. And he had a chauffeur-driven Hispana Souza, uh, which is a fancy brand of Spanish car. And this is Bernard Picasso, Picasso's grandson, who still has the car. Um, I did push for a moment to put the car in the exhibition and it wasn't very practical. It was on the third floor of Tate Modern, but you know, I tried. And he bought a property to spend the summer months in. Uh, this is in, uh, in bois um, and this is the, the building. Now it looks very grand and in many ways it is, but it had quite rudimentary plumbing. It was a little bit, um, yeah, sort of, it wasn't quite camping, but it wasn't as luxurious as you might think when you see a building like this. Uh, but in the early 30s, this is where Picasso and his family start to spend their summers. And he also builds a studio to make sculpture in the, in the stables of the buildings. So that's what you see on the screen there. And the story I'm telling you this evening basically shuttles between Paris and bois -Geloux. So these two places that he is living and working and, and life sort of centers around these places. Now, Picasso's wife um, at the time, uh, Olga Picasso or Olga, Olga Koklova, 
was very much uh, part of the the day-to-day -day for Picasso. Uh, they were contemporaries. She was born in 1891. She had been a dancer with the Ballet Russe. And one of the lovely drawings that you'll see in the show is a drawing of Massine, who Olga Picasso would have known from the Ballet Russe. She'd married Picasso in 1918. And it's quite touching when you actually visit the church that they got married in. They were young immigrants making their way in the city. And she gave birth to their son, Paolo, in 1921. But one thing that we know now, uh, in fact, actually, that we found relatively recently, thanks to an exhibition that was at the Musée Picasso a few years ago, is that uh, Olga Picasso was having a really tough time in, in this sort of late 20s, early 30s, uh, with the political situation in, in Russia. You know, her family had, had lived through great anxiety. A lot of that comes out in the correspondence. She'd had a lot of health troubles. Um, and so you could see that with family life rolling on, there were also a lot of anxieties behind the scenes. Here, there were some nice snapshots. Uh, I like the fact that um, we know that it was Bob the dog. <laughs> Bob the dog appears there relatively often in family pictures. Oh, oh sorry. And, um, and as I say, it just gives you a feel for, for life being um, yeah, quite sort of light and pleasant at times. But of course, something else is happening in Picasso's life at this time. And that person is a young woman called Marie Therese Voltaire. And the presence of Marie Therese Voltaire starts to become very uh, persistent within Picasso's work relatively quickly. And I include this because many of you know it well. So at the end of 1931, Picasso is in, in Paris, and he makes this image, which has a lot of suggestion in it. The face is scrubbed out. You see a woman in an armchair. And as I say, it seems as if he's with his family, but this is the person who's on his mind. Just to give you a few details about Marie Therese Voltaire, she was born in 1909, so quite a bit younger than both Pablo Picasso and Olga Picasso. They met in 1927, as I just mentioned, and that appearance in the art starts to come through in 31. And she was an athlete. You can see here she was a keen swimmer. Uh, she was somebody who uh, loved cycling from one end of Paris to the other. Um, she, as I say, actually, when you look at the her memories, or you, know, you hear her memories of Picasso, she, she enjoys the fact that he was running around the city after her. Um, there's this sense of, uh, of power almost in, in that dynamic. So a picture that he makes on the same day as that one with the scrubbed out face is this other pin painting, uh, which is often called the death of Marat, uh, or the woman with the dagger. It shows a quite violent scene of a, a sort of really quite frightening creature stabbing a figure in a bath. This is a reference to uh, the assassination of, of Marat, which is an event in French history. And often people read this as a, a kind of tension between Picasso's domestic situation and his affair. But again, I want to caution you against being too literal. But it is interesting just to see these things happening simultaneously. More often, we see Marie Therese Voltaire in Picasso's art as this sort of softer um, presence. You know, he's almost a kind of mass of curves. He really seems to enjoy the, the kind of play of form. And, and time and time again, what you're seeing with Picasso is how a person or a thing becomes a vehicle for formal experimentation. Make of that what you will. I'm not making a value judgment here, but it is interesting to see how the invention and the creativity comes out. And again, just to give you a sense of the, the range, I'll, I will throw some of these images up quite quickly. But themes come up time and time again. The woman in an armchair is something that he revisits over and over and over, and he will do that in different styles. 
It's almost as if by keeping one thing constant, you have a sense of all the different uh, inventions you can create around it. <laughs> to, yeah, to my earlier point, um, a woman in an armchair can become something incredibly violent also. But again, to step away from the biography for a moment, see the patterns in the background here. Um, yes, you've got these sort of twisting, contorting shapes, but you've got this interest in, in pattern and in rhythm. And that, again, is something we'll see coming up. Notice the background. <laughs> that one element staying the same or a couple of elements staying the same, the rest of the pieces shifting. And this is one of the most iconic works he makes in that year, where Marie Therese Voltaire's face becomes a phallus. She's, is she sleeping? Does she know we're watching her? Uh, there are all these sort of questions that come up when you, you see an image like this. And I just wanted to, again, make that connection with the collection here. This is a still life that Picasso makes in 22. But one thing I sense quite strongly is that, yes, he's in his 50th year, but he's thinking about things he did in the past. Um, if, you look at, if you remember those earlier pictures I was showing you with the Harlequins outfit, you know, with the, the sort of diamonds and the shapes, all of this is just kind of coming up in new forms throughout his process, and you'll see that in more of the slides. There we go. <laughs> Another thing that has happened in, um, in, in 1932, which is important to put in terms of the broader context, is it's not just about family, it's not just about romance. He's also got a group of friends, uh, and many of them are interested in surrealism. And a man called Michel Larisse is important because Michel Larisse was part of a colonial mission from Dakar to Djibouti. Um, he was working for the French colonial service. He uh, was writing as he took this journey across Africa and was also, as a man of his time, um, simultaneously part of something which is awful in so many ways and, and self-aware to the point where he's critiquing what the French are doing. He's aware of the injustices of colonial transactions. He's aware of the ways in which the French government is collecting art, or I should say more accurately, the material culture. And Picasso writes to Larisse in 32. So there is this sense of a dialogue uh, and not just thinking of, uh, of a Western canon. And he's reading magazines that uh, were talking about some of this. I show you uh, the, the periodical Minotaur. Um, and just a little reminder there of Breton and Bataille, the two sort of poles of surrealism, who Picasso was aware of. He was never fully embedded in surrealism, but this is part of the landscape. And I wanted to flag that because in Chicago there are such great surrealist collections. So... Picasso is making sculpture in the 30s. Again, I just wanted to put some of this out there to give you the, the fuller picture. And the sculpture then finds its way into painting. These things are deliberately baffling, and yet they have a, a kind of thread through. So, so what I'm trying to do here is to give you, to kind of almost like give you your bearings what is sculpture, what is painting, what is he taking from art history, what is he taking from his own work, what is he taking from African material culture. All of this is mixing and mingling, and yet you're still you know, a woman in an armchair. <laughs> it's, uh, it's appropriation in a way that is endlessly inventive. Now, spring is perhaps the most uh, impactful moment in Picasso's year. He is at this point preparing for an exhibition. He's going to have his first retrospective exhibition in 32. Uh, in order to do that, he's actually turned down uh, an offer from the Museum of Modern Art in New York. He's turned down the offer of showing at the Venice Biennale. He wants to have an exhibition at the Galerie Georges Petit in Paris. And why does he want to do that? partly because Matisse has shown there, and Matisse's show has done very badly. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but also, I think, because for, for Picasso, Paris is really where, it, where his career has been forged. It's where his audience is. MoMA at the time was a startup. Uh, it wasn't the, the Fifth Avenue venue that we think about now. It was a space in the Rockefeller Center. There's, there's reasons why I think Picasso made that strategic choice to show uh, in 32 in the Gallery Georges Petit. But with that in mind, he immerses himself in work. And in a relatively short space of time, he creates these three incredible paintings. And I, I remember when we unpacked these, it just gave me goosebumps because it was an incredibly difficult negotiation to have them all in the same space. And the sheer power of having these three works in one room, uh, I will just never forget it. And even within the three, you start to see Picasso testing himself. You see the plant shifting its space. You see the woman who was almost a plant. <laughs> you know, the way in which uh, her body kind of shifts and moves. Um, you see that, that sculptural head with its profile echoed, looking at the sleeping figure. There's that sense of voyeurism, which is kind of coming in. But again, it's moving, it's, it's organic, it's, it's a living thing. Uh, it's an incredibly powerful thing. And it does give you a sense of the level of infatuation uh, present and the, the way in which that was translating to this, this energy for the work. Also there, the, the, the idea of the mirror. So these different ways of looking um, all kind of coming together. And just to give you a sense of the scale there, I, I wanted to just put in this little installation view. These are big works, you know, they are, um, they're just the physicality of painting them, I think is worth noting. So I'm just gonna flip through them. Now this is perhaps one of the best known pictures from the year, which comes just slightly after those three. But again, I just wanted to pause on that. So you are going on this journey and we don't spend enough time looking at pictures. <laughs> we spend way too much time talking about them. <laughs> but this was Picasso simultaneously thinking of Manet, uh, of the art historical idea of looking at yourself in a mirror. Is it an imagined pregnancy? It could be. Um, there's definitely that sense of fertility, of fullness there, uh, the woman's rounded stomach. Um, but I think, in a way, it is also this play of shapes. Uh, and particularly with Picasso, we are so, so tempted to read things very literally. And we have to remember, he is an artist. Um, that's creativity is, is, you know, it's just kind of business as usual. It's, it's a way of life. And... Here you've got this incredible interplay of the stripes, the, the diamonds, the arabesques, um, this idea of trying to see everything in the round, which was something that Cubist pictures were doing when he made them in, the, in 1911 and 1912. So he's also critiquing his earlier self in making these pictures. And he's also looking around him. Um, and I wanted to show this because, again, it's the Barnes Foundation. The Philadelphia Tourist Board should give me a cut. Um, but this was, what, this was what Matisse was doing at the same time. And yes, it's very different. Um, these are works he was making in secret down in the south of France. But the two were in contact, and you can sort of see the, the visual language that they are toying with. And Picasso is definitely thinking about how can he do something that will impress people? How can he... Uh, go beyond what Matisse was doing. And I would just encourage you to think about that in career terms. Um, you know, when I talk to artists, they say it's kind of harder in a way once you've been successful, because people say, well, what next? <laughs> you know, when you're younger, you're out there, you've got everything to prove, you've got nothing to lose. Once you start to build a reputation, then there's an expectation, then you're trying to sort of, uh, the nervousness can kick in. Um, and as I say, I think that's a very relatable thing. So the, uh, the exhibition comes about. Picasso curates the exhibition himself. And when a journalist asks him how he's going to curate the exhibition, he just replies in one word, badly. <laughs> <laughs> and in 
And it really is a greatest hits. Uh, there are so many good pieces in it. He can't actually get everything back. Uh, most of these works are now owned by collectors. And that is a very uh, familiar process to most curators. You have a wish list, you start to negotiate, you hope that people will lend. But often these works are in people's homes, uh, they're in institutions, you aren't necessarily wanting to have something, you know, like a blank space above your mantelpiece for, for a few months. This was, was not a few months, it was a relatively short run, but still, um, it isn't always easy to, to get works together. But still, I would be very happy if, as a curator, I managed to negotiate this group. <laughs> and he did hang things in pretty idiosyncratic ways. He mixed up the periods. He, um, he mixed up themes. But what's interesting, in a year that so much of the work was uh, centered on the image of Mary Therese Voltaire, is that the thing that stood pride of place within the 1932 exhibition was this family portrait. And it's made up of images of his family from different moments. Uh, his younger self peers down as the patriarch over <coughs> Olga Koklova, his wife, over the children, so it, over you know, pictures of his son. So it's, it's interesting how um, this is quite a statement, <laughs> you know, within, the, within this very public space. And we tried to recreate this to an extent in the Tate show. We just managed to get the central grouping, but it was really quite imposing to see that early self-portrait um, you know, staring out at you. Uh, and again, presiding over the group. And that just to give you a, a little feel for those works. Now, the opening of the show was a real party. Yeah, you can see there all the people in their glad rags. The person that didn't go was Picasso. Picasso went to the cinema. <laughs> and my reaction was, well, that was a little bit cool. Uh, and again, an artist friend to me said, no, it's actually really horrible being at openings <laughs> um, because you're there, people are looking at your work. Um, it's quite an easy get out to, to just not show. So make of it what you will. But I was, I was surprised by that. And this is the catalogue resume. And again, I just want you to think about the weight of that. Um, this is a catalogue that, you know, effectively attempts to list everything that Picasso ever made. So you're being, you know, kind of canonized by art history while you're still making work. Uh, that's got to add some pressure. I think it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a strange thing. And people are thinking about, um, about Picasso. The, the show moves from Paris to Zurich, and, uh, and one of the many, many visitors who sees it in, in the different locations, um, Carl Jung. <laughs> and I thought this was a really interesting thing to pull out, because for Jung, uh, he's not a fan of Picasso, you can tell it from these citations. Um, for, for Jung, Picasso is a sign of the times. He talks about this being a, a period that's schizophrenic. He talks about... Um, you know, effectively an unhealthy society. And it's not a surprise to him that people are really interested in Picasso. Um, and so again, if we start to think about the political moment in which this is happening, the early 30s, we all have a sense of the, the trouble that is brewing in the early 30s. Um, you know, curious to see that already people are having these kind of feelings about Picasso's art. Um, in the summer, however, Picasso isn't so worried. <laughs> uh, he, uh, like many of us, wants to sort of, you know, you get the impression he's having a bit of a break in the summer. Um, he spends time in bois uh, And again, not seeing much of Marie Therese Voltaire, but that image playing in his mind. Um, one of the interesting things is that he plans to build a swimming pool uh, in bois but Picasso doesn't swim. Now... Is it just this idea that um, you know his his lover is a is a very keen swimmer? Is it for the you know is it for for Paolo? Who knows? But it's kind of interesting that these things come together. Um, the show had done very well critically, so there was a lot of reason to relax. It hadn't done so well from a sales point of view, um, so a little bit of disappointment there maybe. But um, all of this sort of sitting together. And this is one of the the sort of freest works he makes. And uh, Annette King, who is the conservator at 
Tate actually did uh, some imaging of this picture. And when you put it to, to the light, the paint is so thin. You know, there aren't reworkings, there's not layers of paint. It's as if he did it in one day. Um, just this very loose, free way of working. Because, uh, you know, the pictures I've shown you, they'll often say this day. So it's a good question. Does it mean this day? Does it mean he finished it on that, that day? Did he start it on that day? We don't know for sure, but the actual physical object in this instance does suggest that it was a day's work, um, which is not a bad day's work, really. I wish I was that productive. But, you know, again, for the more observant ones amongst you, do you spot the little gold studs on the back of the chair from those earlier pictures? It's funny how these little things, once you start to notice them again and again, the configurations change, but the, they're there. And, you know, again, I just wanted to put that kind of shocking information out there because there's this sense of all the more reason to want a bit of escapism um, the, uh, the storm clouds are gathering. But nicer to think about bathing, <laughs> nicer to think about, about Marie Therese Voltaire. Um, and I guess I wanted to put some of these images in because it's easy to, to put, make people caricatures, but once you start to look at images, once you start to think of people as human beings, it, it gets more complicated. The theme of the bathers comes out quite a lot in the works that Picasso makes in the fall. And sometimes those works are very playful. And again, there's a whole history of images of bathers, um, which I won't go into this evening, but um, you can uh, definitely trust me on that one. But there's also something potentially kind of dangerous about being by the water. And there is something that I think that, um, yeah, Picasso plays around with, uh, with that sort of surrealist tendency as well. You know, how can shapes shift and change? How do you use nature? And this is a, an image in which he actually uses a, a physical leaf and a butterfly within the painting, um, or, you know, sort of construction, if you like. But that motif of the bather is sort of playing out and becoming something different. There's this sort of strange uh, oscillation between images of bathers in the fall and images of a crucifixion. Now, this may be because when he went to see the exhibition in Zurich, the family uh, you know, drove to, to Zurich. People had thought for a while that he'd seen the Isenheim uh, altarpiece, a very famous altarpiece by Grunewald. I don't think he did, or at least it seems unlikely that he made that stop. Um, but the image of the crucifixion plays out. And again, quite interesting that as a draftsperson, he's oscillating between putting, you know, how do you use the blank sheet versus how do you use the absences? <laughs> um, it's, well, it's, it's all how do you use the blank sheet effectively, but um, always working in this sort of monochrome way and... And again, testing himself. I think that's, that's something that comes out time and again. Here, just to give you a feel of the, um, the sort of, yeah, how that bather image plays out. Now, I talked about the bathers as something joyful. And they are in a way, but something happens, um, Mary Therese actually gets, Mary Therese Voltaire gets a, a waterborne illness from swimming. And in the fall, she's really quite ill. Uh, she loses her hair, which is one of the very iconic things that you see in Picasso's art. And so those very joyful bathers now start to become something that's a bit more sinister. And so there are these multiple images of rescue. Um, and this is one of the more powerful ones it has that, um, still the very stylized motif of the bather, but this time you can see that figure. The reclining figure is no longer the head put back in ecstasy. This isn't an erotic image anymore. This is a kind of lifeless body. And it's interesting how that tension between sex and death, given Picasso's interest in psychoanalysis, in surrealism, these worlds sort of start to meet 
in the work. And, and what I love about these works is they never have a simple reading. You, depending on your own mood, you look at them differently. Um, it's one of the, the real um, kind of gifts, I think, that this work offers us, a, because you do want to, to bring those experiences to it. The way in which those little flowers are painted is very much actually on the physical surface. So it's as if the image has been mapped out and then the, the little flowers have been added. Um, interestingly, the uh, colleagues at the Fondation Baila said that the signature on this one was actually added by Picasso many years later in nail varnish. <laughs> he just came to see it and they said it isn't signed. So I don't know if that's an anecdote, but I quite like it. Certainly it does have a, the, the appearance of nail varnish, that, that sort of pinkish signature in the, in the top corner. And he starts to make prints of the same theme as well. Um, different states of the same print. Uh, you know, just again, I wanted to show you that variety. And printmaking is something that doesn't come easily to Picasso. He's not a professional printer. One of the things I like very much that Jay and Emily have done in the exhibition that you'll see here is that they've actually called out the people that helped or did the printing for Picasso. Um, it is a, a bit of a team effort. Um, when Picasso's left to his own devices as a printer, it's a lot more uneven. Uh, you know, he doesn't get it right. Um, and I think in a way he, he seems to be enjoying that, like, you know, the fact you can't predict it. And again, that wanted to sort of give you, just as we come to, a, to an end here, an image from 33, which happens right at the start, uh, where that image of drowning or rescue has also become a sculpture, has also become abstract. <laughs> um, you know, as I say, I hope you're starting to see some of these motifs, how they've shifted and changed. Um, it's, it's always interesting how he doesn't get complacent. Um, and, you know, again, that fact he was trying that printing, he's going out of his comfort zone. Interesting as a middle-aged man to be still thinking, how do I try and do something that is, is yeah, it has that kind of freshness to it. And I think one of the things that makes me think particularly he's thinking about his younger self is that he decides to um, make a print uh, from a, a 1906 um, woodblock that he made. And actually, I should have used Chicago's version because it's a very nice example <laughs> in the galleries. And do have a look at it because it's so different to everything else in the gallery. Um, there you see it in his studio at the time. And I like the sort of shot, the shots of the studio, because even though they're very stylized, you know, I think that clearly things have been placed a little. Um, there is a sense that this very early work that he did as a young man is in the mix. And the reason I've put a woman called Fernand Olivier in this image is that Fernand Olivier was Picasso's partner at the time he made that 1906 print. And she had um, basically become more visible again in 1932 because she had published a book, uh, not a book, sorry, I should say, she had worked with a newspaper to print her recollections of life with Picasso in the early days. Now, Picasso was not happy about this, um, but he was in correspondence with Fernand Olivier. And again, this is speculation, but I do wonder whether that interaction, plus the fact he's in his 50th year, all of this is making him think, what was I doing back then? Yeah, what, is, what am I doing now? It's for, you know, for so many of us, a significant birthday is an automatic moment of reflection. And my, I guess my point is that why should an artist be any different? This is a picture, again, taken in December 32, Picasso posing in a very forceful way in front of a work by Henri Rousseau. Uh, you'll see that portrait of a woman stacked in the background. Now, Picasso had bought that picture around the time he made the print uh, from a, a, uh, like a kind of thrift store or yeah, a bric-a-brac merchant. I'm not sure what the right expression would be. But the idea was he bought the canvas from a man called Père Soulier, and that canvas was to paint over. Now, the young Picasso was savvy enough to know that that was a painting by Rousseau. 
and you know as a man of means in his yeah as yeah, in middle age he's able to buy other works by Rousseau but it's interesting to sort of see him in these photographs which are very staged bring in these references to his early life um, so that's really where I I wanted to to kind of bring you to um, and again you know by by 33 Hitler becomes chancellor um, the world is in a very different place and I think all the more reason to want to look to your own life to want to sort of get your own bearings um, but uh, but yeah as I say just such a, a marvelous year of invention a year of wonders as it was called and uh, and the exhibition is a wonder too, and it's on through April the 4th, is it? 8th? April 8th. So, you know, please make the most of it. Um, the collection here is just so incredible, and, and the range of the collection and the, and the range of the works you'll see on the, on the walls really gives you a great feel for the breadth of, of this incredible artist. Um, we have some time for questions, and if you raise your hand, uh, the, uh, the lovely staff of the Art Institute will bring a microphone your way so everybody can hear them. But thank you. Uh, something that struck me in the evaluation of just the one year of his life with him just turning 50 and all that was the beginning showing the more scenes of ecstasy then the relaxation about three quarters of the way through and then the death at the end. Is that a theme that you see later on in his life too of sort of exploring life with being young and the ecstasy then the relaxation and the death at the end? I think that sense of... Um a rhythm is, in many ways, was a seasonal thing, and some of it is to do with, you know, what's what's happening. I don't think there's a, a particularly kind of systematic pattern to it, and I think that um, although I quite like the the sort of um, the the drama of the story unfolding, it's also it's easier for us to do that retrospectively. So we should probably be a little bit cautious that you know, good, bad things happen all simultaneously. Um, but I do think it's one of the nice things about working with art that was made, you know, almost 100 years ago, is you do get the luxury of stepping away and seeing these kind of patterns. And, you know, and again, maybe there's a seasonality to that too. You know, we, we all tend to feel a bit cheerier in the summer. And certainly it changes the amount of work Picasso makes. He doesn't make as much work in the summer. So, um, you know, it's nice to think he took a bit of a vacation. We have a question right here. Thank you for the great presentation. I look at, uh, <clears throat> at Picasso, I think I'm in love with his blue period mm -hmm. more than the next development of his paintings, the uh, cubism, et cetera, et cetera. Well, what I'm do you think about his blue period? Well, I, I couldn't have queued that up better because do you remember I was saying that the, sh the work that sold at the beginning of the year in auction for a record price was one of Picasso's early works from that. It wasn't a blue period work, but it was that early moment. Most buyers in 1932 wanted Picasso's blue period or they wanted Picasso's rose period. They wanted those early works. So fabulous choice. I love the blue period. Um, they are really um, atmospheric and... And I think the, the general economy of those works is so audacious to actually work with such a limited range of color. Often he's using um, the, just the canvas ground, you know, the, the primed canvas to actually do something active within the painting, which is really inventive. Um, but, but as I say, that was the general taste in 32. And, and even now I think people 
do gravitate towards the, the blue period. And maybe that's another reason why he wanted to look back to that moment, because if everybody liked that, what am I going to do next? You know, what am I going to do to rekindle that same emotional response um, in my audience? Um, so as I say, thank you for that, because uh, you've got great taste, clearly. <laughs> I was wondering if you could just talk about the uh, the experience of modeling for a abstract portrait. That what that might have been like uh, to sit there and, and like do you have to sit there for the whole time, or is it a sketch, or I don't know. It's it's a fantastic question, and actually, it's the one. It's it's actually something I I'm glad you've raised because most of these portraits weren't made with a model in front of Picasso. They were. Uh, things done from memory. One of the things that Arkham and I were really surprised about when we worked on this exhibition about 32 is how little time he saw Mary Therese Voltaire compared to how often she appears in his art. And although there's a real likeness there, it's really, um, it's, it's, it's an idea. It's, I mean, she becomes a line very often. You think of that sculptural profile, you think of the curves of the body. Um, it's, it's a fantasy in a way, and um, so I think the, there wouldn't have been those sort of sitting sessions, but I do think he was really keenly kind of looking and thinking, and, and I would imagine it would have been a really strange experience to see yourself abstracted in that way. Um, definitely one of the, the challenging parts of being with an artist, I would imagine, but then maybe also one of the thrilling things, to, to see yourself become... Uh, yeah, something, something so much more. In a, yeah, it's. I think that's perhaps part of the reason why people were so drawn to him, um, because it was a mirror in a way. You know, a way of seeing something different in yourself, in in seeing the impact that you were having on on that creativity. So, thank you for that. We have a question. We have a question over here. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I found the the part about the overlap with Jung to be a really fascinating anecdote. Do you know if that was like a formal diagnosis from meeting Picasso or a analysis of his art? It was the latter, it was analysis of the work. Um, and it's quite, it was, you know, it's pretty, pretty damning in a way. And, and it is a diagnosis, I think that's the, the curious thing. And it, for me, it made me think about how in the 30s, you know, of course, um, Sadly, there was a whole di discourse around degenerate art, you know, modern art being abstract and, and unhealthy. Um, so, so that tension is there, but, but it wasn't an actual, uh, you know, a sort of diagnosis with a, with a, with a patient or a subject. It was, it was a reading of who might make works like this. Just the question at the front here. I'll be right down. <laughs> that's, a, that's a real workout. <laughs> and we have, uh, we have time for about two more questions too. So after this one, just one more, if anyone has a burning one. Thank you, I'll be quick. So what was his response to that? Because he seemed um, very reflective about his own experiences and, and wanting to be out there. When Jung came out with this very damning diagnosis of him and you had mentioned something about psychotherapy too about I mean was he very much in that area he, he wasn't um so yeah undergoing therapy he wasn't within a within that sort of practice so it's a good point to raise there I think it's more that um he was moving in circles that had a real interest in psychoanalysis and a lot of the ideas that we take for granted nowadays in terms of therapy like, you know, young boys and mothers and, you know, these sorts of things that have almost become a cliche, all the kind of Freudian things. All of that was new in the 30s. You know, Freud, a lot of Freud's major works had only just been translated. So um, 
this is also another kind of caution when we want to look at Picasso too literally when we see images of things like sexual violence. There were lots, there was a lot of talk about fantasy and the violent nature of desire and, and things that were shocking to people. The idea that children might be sexual beings, you know, this stuff was pretty controversial. It's, and it's, um, and it, as a group of artists, writers, academic, yeah, li um, intellectuals, this sort of thing was, was part and parcel of the conversation. I don't know of any response that, that Picasso has to that, that reading of Jung. Um, and, you know, it would, it would be kind of curious to know. Uh, but I, uh, yeah, thank you for, as I say, for raising that. It's, it's not something that, well, maybe you would have enjoyed it. I'd be interested to see what you think. <laughs> It's, uh, it's, it's quite the diagnosis. I think, is it? Oh, yeah. And this will be our final question. So actually going off of that question, um, so because his um, career was just so extensive as far as impressionism, well, I wouldn't say impressionism, but um, would you say that he developed into a surrealist because of working with these um, repeating themes and just sex violence, kind of like the recycle, the continuing to test himself with different materials, and also just being in like the literal time and place of surrealism and just like political upheaval. Would you say that he, and I also do not know when he died as far as like what how does he develop from, from this year that also was such a huge year also being his 50th year? I'm curious about that. I think there are, I mean, the two parts to that, I mean, Picasso lives a lot lo longer and his art continues to evolve, you know, through the 40s, 50s, 60s. Yeah, it has these different chapters and, and actually, again, that's one of the things that's really compelling about Picasso is that it's almost he becomes these sort of different artists. And, and some of those things that, that we looked at tonight, the idea of a woman in a chair, the idea of patination, the idea of a really powerful line, the idea of the voyeur, those help you get your bearings when you're trying to think, how is this the same person? Because some of those preoccupations are constant, even when the work starts to look very different. Um, going back to the, the first part of your question about surrealism, Breton, André Breton and Georges Bataille were the, had these two different kinds of surrealism and both of them at different moments tried to sort of kind of commandeer Picasso to be uh, more formally involved in what they're doing. Picasso, I sense, is quite astute in not really falling into either camp. He it seems to be relatively comfortable with his work being discussed in those ways. And definitely, I think, you know, you do see some of that in the work, you know, this, the, the little string that becomes a person or the butterfly and the leaf, you know, it, it's all very suggestive and some of it uses texture. He was interested, we know, in, in ritual and magic. This is something that would have come out in those conversations with Michelle Larisse about what he was encountering in Africa. Um, so whereas in Picasso's early career, he'd been interested in African material culture from a formal point of view, he wanted to see masks, he wanted to, you know, this was just uh, to sort of talk in, in loose terms, he was using it for the, the visual import. I think by the 30s, he's more interested in meaning uh, and that kind of becomes part of the mix, uh, what does, how does, you know, how does act, the act of creating become part of practice, which again might tie back into the psychoanalysis piece. So like many of us, at any given moment, we have, we suddenly find that all the things we're interested in start to conflate, or maybe that's just me. <laughs> um, but I do think there is a, there are moments where you see these things meeting and mingling. And that concludes our program. Thank you so much, Nancy.